Hi, um, thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, I've, I think I shared one time, I counted all the churches uh, in Sovereign Grace that I've actually been to, and something like, I think, 27, 29 up now, and I always get a, yeah, a, it's, a, it's a particular joy to be able to see churches. Now, I've been here three times, three different locations. This is a wonderful location with a window. Uh, I'd be tempted to be looking outside and not care about who's speaking, but I, I know you are godlier than I am, and you probably will um, be listening to uh, the, the message. Please open your Bibles in Matthew chapter 9. And um, one of the, the, uh, the concerns I have or, or um, in, my, in my heart, I really would, would want you to know that um, not just that we think very highly of you, but we think very highly of John and Lori and their parents and their legacy, their second generation sovereign grace kids. Um, and we love the fact that you've planted a church here. But I felt I also, my burden is that we don't consider our situation in Mexico as extraordinary, uh, as out of the ordinary would be, would be more the, 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 the way I would describe it. Um, we are different. We different society, different conditions of our economy, our government, our history, our culture, our culture, our language. But we're not extraordinary. We're not out of the ordinary of what it is to be a Christian in this world. And when you travel the world and you visit other churches, you'll realize that you have much more in common with another Christian, uh, with a person, a Christian in China or in India or in, in South America than you have sometimes with your own neighbors right next door. And, and, and that, in that sense, I don't come here to, in, in any way, um, communicate something that, like what we're doing, is, is not something that you should expect and desire and pray for in in your country. I think I shared um, many years ago in a church in, in Pennsylvania, and I told, um, is this thing, oh, this is metal, and so this thing was magnetic and it's sticking to the, um, and I said, in certain aspects, a church in the United States is more countercultural than a church in Mexico, a, a Christian church in Mexico. There's factors in our country that contribute to, to the building of churches, whereas in the United States, there's factors that do not contribute to you building a church just by the way that your, uh, uh, the, the way of thinking of the American mind. So please do not think, oh, well, this guy is saying these things because he's from Mexico. No, actually, I'm thinking right now. I'm in Austin, and I'm trying to think as a Texan. I wore Levi's just because of you guys. <laughs> and I want to share with you, uh, I think, what Christ's passion is. And, uh, and hopefully it will serve you be thinking about your own community, your own country, and whatever God has laid on your heart that he wants you to, to do for his kingdom. So let's pray before I read, and I'll be reading from verse 35 to the end, uh, to the uh, verse 15 in, in chapter 10. Okay? Father, so I pray that you will bless this church, and you will bless all that will uh, be listening today to your word as we read and as you speak to us, and I pray that you will give us hearts to 
to listen to you. We need your words. We need your building up of our lives and our faith. We need your Holy Spirit to affirm us, to guide us, to enlighten us, to, to help us feel Christ's passion for the nations and for the crowds and for the communities in this world that you have created and it is yours. And your kingdom, Lord, is, is invading this world. So we pray that you will bless this time as your purposes be fulfilled. Lord, we pray let your kingdom come to our lives in this moment so that your purposes will be fulfilled in us first. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you will bless me and help me uh, share in intelligent way um, what I have to say, that it is not my thoughts, that may then be your thoughts for the benefit of those that are listening. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I will be praying, and it's, uh, I haven't spoken in English in, in a long time, so I'm going to be a little slow, and if I mess up, you can all laugh, and I won't mind uh, with my pronunciation. <laughs> So I'm reading from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and, in, and it says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them for them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, Shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Um, this passage has helped me expand my understanding, my perspective of what the kingdom of God is really is and I, I want I wanted to share this with you because I really want to encourage you to live out the gospel in your lives in ways that are very tangible I want to encourage you to pray and have faith for God what God wants you to do in 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 the gospel mission and our gospel our joint gospel mission. I really want to encourage you that um, 
that to understand that what we've received from others and what we're trying to communicate to others at the same time is the same gospel. It's the same thing that's happening right here with Jesus and his disciples. It's the same thing that I, we received when, when the sovereign grace leaders came to us and brought the gospel to us. And now we are trying to share it with others in other parts of the world. And it's the same gospel and the same mission that started this church and should continue to bring this church to where God wants to, it to go. Um, so what, I, what, I, what this passage, the reason I chose this passage, passage it's because it did help me understand what God's kingdom is. And it helped me understand this concept that I've seen in the Gospels, uh, we were in the middle of, uh, of a series in Luke, and I understand you're in the middle of a series in Mark. And when you read the Gospels continually, and, and you know, read them from start to finish, and you, and you study them, you see that something is happening when Jesus arrives on this earth. And there's literally... I can't find a better word for it, but it's literally an invasion. John talks about the invasion of the light that shines in the darkness. There's something that happened that changed the reality of this world. And, and Jesus comes, and this, this, this um, verse talks about him, his mission, and how he takes that mission that he was carrying out, and then encourages or, or calls his disciples now to then hit them doing it. And so I'm basically going to talk about this passage in two points. So it's, it's, it's a simple enough passage to understand what's going on, but at the same time, it's something that's very significant, what, what, what is happening here. So I'm just going to share two points. My, my first point is that... The coming of Jesus, Jesus came to bring in to this world the kingdom of God. It says here that, that Jesus was going out proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Now, Matthew, is. this is not the first time that this, it says this. It says that when it started, when Jesus started his ministry in Chapter 4, it says that Jesus started proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. If you read chapter 9, in the, in the, uh, the, 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 this is the end of chapter 9, but if you, in chapter 9, you see Jesus healing a paralytic. He heals a woman with a discharge of blood. He resurrects a young girl from the dead. He heals two blind men. He casts out the demon and, uh, uh, out of a mute man. And though, so he was restored and he started speaking again. And then Matthew says, So Jesus went out throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. All of the Gospels make that point. In fact, Luke says that Jesus was bring, proclaiming and bringing the good news. Here it says he was proclaiming the Gospel. And, and Luke says in chapter 8, he was proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. So the question is, what was Jesus gospel. What was he preaching? We preach Jesus and we say the gospel is Jesus coming, dying on the cross and being resurrected. But he had not died yet and he had not resurrected. In fact, it was a veiled uh, announcement. He was telling his disciples that he was going to die and he was going to suffer and he was going to be raised again. And they never believed that and never understood that until he was actually raised. Then they figured, oh, so that's what you were talking about. 
what was Jesus proclaiming? So if you understand a little bit the history of Israel and, and, and the Old Testament, you know that the, the Jewish people were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for a king, a deliverer, someone that was going to come out of the descent. He was a descendant of David. And he was going to be a king, and he was going to restore the glory of the kingdom. He was going to free up uh, uh, Israel from the oppression of the Roman Empire. He was going to bring and make everything good again. Uh, we had the privilege of going to Israel a couple of years ago, and one of the things that was amazing to me is that we spoke to many Jewish scholars and and uh, and and and. And, and, and uh, rabbis and, and they were all it was, it was amazing to me that they were all waiting for the Messiah and they said we don't believe Jesus was the Messiah we believe he was a great man but he's not the Messiah and we said why don't you believe that Jesus is the Messiah he says look at our world if he was the Messiah why would our world still be so messed up so we're waiting and one of the things that was more remarkable to me was that, that we met a lady who was a, 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 a teacher, a, a doctor that she was teaching one of the universities, and she said, we, we had the privilege in, in um, Nazareth to build our home. Says, but all the Jewish homes, they have a, a wall. We have a wall that is not finished. And it's, it's not painted or plastered or nothing. You can see the bricks. And she says, the reason we do that is as a daily reminder. Every time we go past that wall, we are reminded things are still not fulfilled. We're waiting for the Messiah that's going to finish and, and fulfill all the pro prophecies and, and bring order to the world. He's going to fix things. And I said, these people are waiting for the Messiah much more eagerly than we are. The return of our Messiah. Jesus Christ. So what was Jesus preaching? What was the gospel, the, the good news that he was preaching? The good news that he was preaching was the kingdom of God is here. The Messiah has come. It's time. Basically, he was pointing the finger to himself saying, I am the king. That was the good news. The good news for a broken world that he had come. So in Luke chapter 4, when he starts his ministry, it says that he comes to Nazareth and they ask him if he wants to read the Bible. He wants to read a scroll and he un unrolls the scroll and he finds Isaiah chapter 61 and Jesus starts speaking and reading. And this is what he says. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight of the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And he was, that's a prophecy of the Messiah, the anointed one of God to bring good news to the poor, the broken. This world is broken. I know Mexico's broken. I hope you guys know that Texas is broken also. This world is in darkness. This world... Um, is lost the good news is the wait for the king is over the kingdom of God came with Jesus Christ to start a new day in which the darkness was were, was going to be dispersed by the light by the power by the love of the Messiah King 
Jesus was proclaiming the new day in which the compassion of God was expressed tangibly in multiple manifestations of his mercy and favor upon all those that came to him with their afflictions. The healings and casting out of demons was the demonstration that the king was here on earth. I'm reading these, this, these paragraphs because I wouldn't be able to say them uh, without reading them. So I wrote them and I, I wrote down in my notes, read these things because you're going to mess up if you don't read them. The gospel that Jesus was preaching was the good news that the love of God for lost sinners has come. It is the living expression of the divine intention to come to this sinful world and draw near to us the hurting and the afflicting. Um, and change things by healing the world of sin and its consequences. I just realized that, that didn't make a lot of sense. To draw near. He's drawing near to us the hurting and the afflicting. We are the hurting and the afflicting. The gospel is the loud proclamation that God cares for, for his creation. That he loves the men and women he created in his image and wants to save them. Even by paying for them by the shedding of the blood of his own son. He has come to rescue us from the darkness, evil, and ruin of humankind because of the effects and consequences of sin. So that's the gospel that Jesus was preaching. The good news. Hey, I'm here. And I'm here because of you. The poor and the afflicted and the blind. The, 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 the dead in their sins. And notice that it says that he was proclaiming these things. And then he says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The motivation of God, the motivation of the gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus had compassion for the crowds. Look, see how he sees the crowds, harassed, helpless. He saw them as lost sheep, hurting, vulnerable, hopeless. The, the, the compassion of Jesus was the natural reaction of God, the coming king. He comes to his world, the world he created, and what, what stirs him the gut reaction, the insights of Jesus were moved because of what he saw. Jesus' compassion represents the grace of God. The compassion of Jesus is the expression of his grace. Because when he saw what sinners had harvested, how do you say harvest? Uh, but you don't say harvest when, you know, you sow and you reap. <laughs> so what they were reap, what we were reaping is just the effects of our own sin. But what the king now on the earth, his boots are on the ground. He's on, is here. He sees the messed up world. He sees what man has done. His gut reaction is not judgment. His gut reaction is grace. Says, uh, John says that Jesus came to reveal the grace of God. In Jesus, what you see is the goodness of God having mercy on a broken world. So we're seeing the God's grace become a reality in Jesus. That, 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 that way that John says, you know, that, that expresses that, he's basically saying, we saw grace become a reality in Jesus Christ. So he's seeing the crowds and he preaches to them the good news. Hey, there's good news. I'm here and I'm here to help you. And I'm here to care for you. So the people, their needs, they thought were just, hey, I'm sick. 
I have a demon inside of me and I can't speak. So Jesus would heal them. And Jesus would cast out demons. And Jesus was resurrecting kids. And he was doing all these things. Why? Because he's the Messiah. And because he was having compassion and caring for the needs of the folks. So the question that I had when I read this the first time is, okay, so who were the crowds? You know who the crowds were in Jesus' time? Were the, the Jews. When he, this was written when Jesus was in, in Gentile country. He was in Galilee. And there were all kinds of Arab peoples there. Uh, the Pharisees, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the lepers, the Romans, the shepherds, the peasants. I mean, all of these people were in, in the crowds, men, women, old people, young people, kids. There was, there was, it doesn't distinguish. It doesn't say there were poor people. There were rich people and poor people, healthy people and sick people. He had compassion on the crowds. What are the crowds in Round Rock? Who are the crowds in Austin? When I think of the crowds in Juarez, they include all kinds of people. Even corrupt politicians. Even cartel killers, drug addicts, people that are working in industry, and also people that are out on the street, living on the street, selling things to people, asking people for money in the corners. Kids that are in orphanages, prostitutes, people that are would be what you guys call LGBT and other letters. When we were at, um, there was um, a time where we were serving and we had a, a hospice, I think it's what it's called, for people that were dying of AIDS. And, um, and so these, the people, these folks that were in this hospital uh, the Sovereign Grace Help, help uh, Equip um, would come to church. And if you've never seen somebody that has AIDS, that's not just HIV, but has AIDS, they were very physically weak. They couldn't sit. We have very fluffy chairs, not, not like these chairs, but fluffy chairs. And they would still have to bring a cushion to be able to sit in those chairs because of the pain, it was painful for them to sit down. And I told the church, I said, guys, look, we can't, we can't be the, the church of Jesus Christ and, and say we're here to bless the world, have compassion. If somebody comes and sits down, what are you going to do? Are you going to move one chair on the side? Are you going to ask your kids, move away? What are we going to do? And then when, you know, the war was, we knew there were cartel people in the congregation just checking us out. And I spoke to them. And we were under threat, physical threat. My family was under threat. And I knew the guys were there, and I had to speak to them. Uh... And I told, you know, people were scared. What are you going to do? You know, this guy was obviously armed. I said, are we going to have compassion and preach the gospel? Or are we going to close the door? Brothers, who are the crowds in Austin and in your communities? Right now, our crowds include people from all over the world. There's... There was a point where there was, I think, 70,000 migrants in Juarez. This, uh, right now, 500 people, uh, immigrants, are being deported into Juarez a week. Um, some of them come without any shoes, taken from detention centers, without a jacket, uh, into the streets of Juarez. 
And I thank God for our government because they've, they've been so uh, uh, efficient in just serving them. And, and we're trying to work with them and see how we can help these people. I guess it's not going to stop. I mean, these people are going to keep coming and coming. And, and now there's communities, there's shelters where there's people, mostly people from Honduras, and there's other shelters, mostly for people from Cuba. There's people from Haiti. There's people from Africa. There's people from Europe. Uh, there's people from everywhere. And right now, I think there's still about 20,000 uh, immigrants still in the city haven't gone back to work uh, or their, their places. They, some, some people can't go back, but uh, when I would see them in these sh uh, makeshift shelters, they would do like little tents right next to the bridges. I would say, why are these people suffering here? Why don't they go back home? And I could sense I was not having compassion for them. And you can't have compassion with people if you don't stop and talk to them. And hear their stories. And be, show an interest. And that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're trying to sit with the people in the refugee centers just to listen to their stories. To read the Bible with them. To be their friends. And hopefully God will show us how we can help and now I think our church is going to become a multicultural, multinational church just because all these refugees, all these immigrants are in our town. So praise God. But the question is, who are the crowds that we should see here? Because if we're not seeing the crowds here, we shouldn't be looking at the crowds in Africa or in Latin America or in other places. Okay? This is important. We can't try to show compassion for other nations and not for our own community. In fact, I would say that you, you should not. You should not. Uh, be doing that. It's easier to have compassion in a third world country than it is in your own neighborhood. I know that for experience. My second point is that Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and then he made a transition from him looking at the crowds immediately to his disciples. You noticed in verse 37, he saw them like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples. So Jesus looks at the crowds. He, he has compassion for them. Then he turns around and looks at his disciples. And he tells them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So the, 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 the Jesus' compassion leads him to look at his disciples. And this is very important. He has compassion in the crowds. Now he wants the disciples to pray to God to send people to those crowds. Okay, this is Jesus this is Jesus' methodology. He has compassion, so what do I do? Oh, guys, pray so that God will send people to these crowds. The harvest, uh, it's, it's interesting that he uses the word harvest. The, it, the crowds are like, they, 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 they're sheep, they're lost, but the harvest is an agricultural term. This is, this is the, the seeds that are ready to, to be picked up. I don't know how to say this in, in English, but you, you understand what I'm, I'm talking about, right? He, he, he's, he's, um, he's, he says there's got to be workers that go and gather all of this plentiful harvest. So the, the reason I read all the way to chapter 10 is because there's no numbers in the original letter from Matthew. He just says, 
the prayer and say, Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers to his harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples. So it's the same story. There's no breaking in the numbers. We just put the numbers so that you can find these places in the Bible. So the, the names of the 12 apostles by name, chosen by Jesus, are the answer to the prayers that he wants their own disciples to be praying. So he wants them to be praying, and though he chooses 12, and then it says in verse 5, these 12 he sends out to the harvest. So he's actually, I'm going to put it in our terms, Jesus is, is, is asking us to pray for people that we sent out to the plentiful harvest out in the crowds, and we're the ones they're gonna, he's going to use to answer our own prayers. Isn't Jesus, I mean, isn't he funny to do things like this, you know? Uh, but he wants us to pray. Why does he want us to pray? If he's going to send us anyway, we just send us, Jesus. I mean, we don't have to pray if you're going to send us anyway. No, I want you to pray. Because the harvest is mine. The harvest is God's harvest. And I'm going to send you, but I want you to be sent in my power, with my gospel, with my compassion to represent me. And you've got to pray for that. And you notice that he sends them out and says, don't carry a purse. Don't take money. Don't take food. Don't take extra shoes. Don't take a coat. Just go as you are sent. Why? Because it says, I'm going to provide for you in the harvest. Don't worry about it. We read, uh, what was that, Luke, um, what was the verse we read? Somebody read this. The, the seek ye first the kingdom of God. If you seek the kingdom of God, if you're doing kingdom work, just don't worry about it. All your needs are going to be fulfilled. We read it in a way that's sort of like, all I have to do is be a good guy. You know, don't sin too bad, and God is going to take care of me. Don't worry. No, it's the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom and you are doing the kingdom work, Jesus is saying, look, you go. I'll be there. Isn't that the same thing he said in the Great Commission? All authority is given to me. Okay, I'll be with you until the end of time. So go and make disciples. I'm sorry if I shout. I know it's not, you guys are not used to that. And Mexicans, well, not no Mexicans, just me. We tend to get overexcited about these things. What Jesus is, is doing here is saying, go, you do the work, I'll be with you. What I was doing, and you saw me doing, and you heard me teaching, and you heard my proclamation, now you go and do the same. Now, he sends his 12 disciples, and we sometimes get tricked into thinking, well, they were the apostles, of course they can do everything. But then he sends 72 guys. And they weren't apostles. They were just disciples. He sends those 22, 72, and they do the same thing. And notice what it says that he does. He sends them out. He says, and, and he gives them authority. And he, and, and he gives them instructions. Go saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So uh, where it says... says um, uh, he goes, it sends him out. It says in verse 1, he called his disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. He gives them authority to go and do exactly the same thing that he was doing. And one of the things that, that, was, that struck me is that this isn't like clever methodology. This isn't like Jesus was discipling his 12, and so those 12 now have discipled another 12, and so we kind of reproduce, and we're making disciples, and the church is growing. No, no, no. Remember I said at the beginning, this is an invasion. These people are going in the name of the king to proclaim the good news of the king and to demonstrate that the king is here. That's what they were doing. 
And one of the things that, and I, I'm glad Ricky reminded me of this, um, one of the things that struck me is that this, this, this thing is so evident in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book of Luke that I, I said we were preaching. They remember, I don't know if you remember the time where Jesus cast out a demon and the Pharisees accused him that he cast out the demon because he was working for the demon. He has a demon himself. That's why he can cast out the demon. Jesus says, wait, wait a minute, guys. That doesn't make any sense. Is the devil divided against himself, fighting against him? I mean, that's, that's just crazy. And so he shares this little story and he says, he says imagine, you know, if uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little illustration. He says, if by the finger of God is, it is that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks, attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. So what he was saying is saying, look, the devil, pretty strong, he's armed, taking care of his own stuff. But what happens if you get another that's stronger than him? coming he comes in and he takes everything and he takes the spoil and shares it with everyone and saying if I'm doing that by the finger of God then the kingdom has come upon you so what was Jesus saying when he gives authority to the disciples he said, okay, you guys go out and demonstrate that the king is here. The stronger one is here, and we're going to take what he has taken away from me. I love it that when I say that, everybody gets quiet because this is very serious. What we're doing as a church, we're not wanting to become good people. We're not here to, to say, oh, you know, our church is great. We have a great band and we have great preaching. Isn't that great? We are the concrete evidence, the tangible evidence that a king has come to this earth. And we're part of the spoils. And now we're being sent out to gather more spoils for the king. And what he's saying is, hey, you guys, you're not very impressive. You know, this short Mexican guy, you know, older now, and he's, you know, he's a little crazy, whatever. I can even use him. And we can go different places where you can never imagine we would go. And I can gather a harvest there because it's my power. It's my grace. It's my compassion. It's my love. And I'm doing it. And I'm freeing up people from, from their sin and the consequences of their sin because I, that's what I do. I'm the king, the awaited one, the one that's going to restore all things, the one that's going to come and fix everything, a new earth, a new heaven. He's, he's just going to recreate his creation and for, so that his church in a perfect world We'll live with him forever. And we're the agents of this kingdom. So our mission is not to convert people to Christianity. Our mission is to proclaim a gospel full of the power of God so that the people are freed up to serve the real king. That makes all the difference in the world. When I think about that, I'm ready to march out and go out there. And brothers and sisters, you guys have to think about these things because your mission starts right here. You're part of sovereign grace. You're part of a wonderful work of grace of God 
in, in this world. You, your hands are full of the riches of the gospel. That what the world needs, you have. And you can go out there. And you can partner with others. Like, like uh, we can partner with, with uh, um, uh, what's this guy's name? Ranger and Ethi Michael in, in, in Ethiopia. I've never been to Ethiopia. I have no idea what's in Ethiopia. But he is there. And we can partner with him and say, look, Michael, first of all, we're going to pray for you. And we're going to pray for the power of God to fall upon you and the anointing of God so that you can talk with, with, with all the, that energy and power and vigor with, with faith so that these people can hear that gospel that's going to free them up. We're going to pray for the power of God to manifest itself so that people can see that what you are doing is representing the great king of, of the heavens in this earth. So, I have no idea. I forgot to turn my clock on. <laughs> I have no idea what time it is. I should be closing. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I have a few things that I want to bring to you as application. First of all, uh, and, and you can write these so you, you can meditate on them through the week. Um, is the gospel of the kingdom of God marvelous to you? Think about that. Because sometimes we think what we have is something we're trying to convince people about. This is, you know, like a, like a doctrine. But to Christ, it was an announcement that had power to liberate. Is the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the kingdom of God, marvelous to you? Did you, did you revel in it? Did you say, wow, what, what has been given to us so that we can bring to the world? Number two. How's your compassion? And brothers, our sinful nature, still present, God has saved us, but man, we, we still got our flesh. Our sinful flesh will naturally, by itself, close up to other people. You know, I could go to the Best Buy and be in those lines waiting to go to the cashier and some of these guys are like the gamers you know what the gamers are i hope there's i, w I would say i hope there's no gamers here but not, that's wouldn't be godly <laughs> if you're a gamer uh you know t that's completely foreign to me i have never played a video game other than that you know when it was in college i had that pac-man i thought that was i could never get up past 100 points probably the, the, and these guys, you know, they look like they haven't showered in three days, you know, and they've just been playing games and something was damaged and they go to the Best Buy and they're buying a new keyboard, a new little thing there. And I'm looking at what these guys, what are these guys doing with their lives, you know? I judge them. That's sin. Jesus was, would be standing in the, that Best Buy and he would be, happy to see one of these guys and say, hey, man, uh, I got great news for you. But we, we do not lean to compassion. We lean to selfishness. Look at the crowds. Because we can make the crowds our adversaries. People to get away from. People that we can we need to hide from. People that, oh, they're different. No, you know, I got to protect my kids. I got to protect myself. I don't want to be contaminated. That is foreign to Jesus. If you don't want to uh, be, you know, friends with somebody because they're strange, that you should at least pray for them with all the compassion and ask God to have compassion and be merciful and loving to these people. 
See, I, to me, that's like, God, I'm guilty. I, I don't know how to do this. I got to ask God to make me like him. Number three. Uh, do you have faith in the kingdom of God? Do you have faith that you have been entrusted with the most powerful message that there is to overcome the darkness of this world? Do you have faith in that king that if you purpose in your heart, Lord, I want to do your work, use me, send me to the harvest. I'm here, Lord, I'm ready, send me. Do you have faith that God will use you and empower you and back you up? And I, I you know, in Sovereign Grace, we're, we try to be humble people. And we say things like, well, you know, I'm nobody, I'm good for nothing, I'm just here, you know, just misery. You know. That's the false humility. God saved me. It doesn't matter what I am. He is within me. He chose me so that I can be sent. Do I have faith that he's going to use me, that he's going to back me up, that his spirit is going to empower me, that he's going to give me words? He told the disciples, whenever you're in front of kings and your legs start shaking, don't worry. Open your mouth and I will give you the words so that you can testify to them of my kingdom. Paul says in Timothy, 2 Timothy, he says, when I was before, I don't know if he's talking about the emperor, I mean, all these authorities being judged. He says, I was weak. I would have just fallen in despair. I was by myself. There was nobody with me. But God strengthened me. And I was able to defend the faith before the emperor of Rome. Do you have faith? Four, are you praying with faith? Are you praying that God will give you Austin? Are you praying that God will give you hundreds of students from the University of Texas? Are you praying that God will give you your neighbors? You're praying that God will give you your kids. Are you praying God will give you the nations? Lord, are you praying for other nations? Are you praying for other counties? Are you praying with faith, Lord? Are you praying every day that God will give you conversions right here, right now? Brothers, if we're not praying... What are we trusting in? God in his, I don't know, wisdom, he designed it so that it works through prayer. His kingdom is extended through our prayers. Best thing we can do is pray. So what, what, uh, what we did right now, the pastoral, I mean, we joined in prayer for the nations and what, what these men are doing. We must pray. Nothing is going to happen if we don't pray, you get not, if you, because you ask not. You know, just uh, James didn't say, you dummies. You know? <laughs> but that's what it is. If you, you, you're not asking for anything. How do you expect to get anything? And number five, are you willing to partner with others in doing everything you can to serve the purpose of the gospel of his kingdom in your community? One of the things that I'm very much aware of, when we are being invited because we're sovereign grace in Latin America, I am very much aware that I wouldn't be able to go to any place and share anything, nothing, about the grace of God, about the mercies of God, about loving uh, the church, uh, I mean, anything like that, if Churches like you guys are not living it here. 
we can't proclaim anything that we're not living. So just being faithful in your own church is the, the, the backup that we can say we know what we are saying is to be true because there's people not just in Mexico, but in Texas, in other parts of the world. They're living it. They're free. And they're loving God, and they're worshiping God, and they're serving God. And they're, they're doing kingdom work. If, 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 if the churches, if all of us are not doing it, then we can't go out and say that we're doing it. Does that make any sense? Right? So, brothers and sisters, that's our challenge in Mexico. We had all those little stars up there, churches. My burden is to say, wow, guys, those guys in Texas, they, they, they think there's a Sovereign Grace Church in Guadalajara. So this better be Sovereign Grace Church in Guadalajara. Okay? And we better be faithful to what we were given. It was given to us for free. We better be faithful that that's what we're living. So if you go to Guadalajara and you say, wow, here's our brothers and sisters. And not because sovereign grace is special. It's not that. It's that that's just what was given to us. And we were taught the gospel faithfully. And we were taught about the grace of God faithfully. We better be building churches with grace. And I'm talking about something different now, but I am finishing. I'm sorry. Um, are you willing to partner? Um, are you willing to join hands and to have a mentality that we are a family of churches throughout the world trying to give freely what we received freely? Um, you do the work of the kingdom here. We'll do the work of the kingdom over there. When all is over, we'll join our voices in heaven to sing to our king. And hopefully all together we'll hear, you did a good job. You guys did a good job. You were faithful. And that's all there is, brothers and sisters. That's all we want to do. That's all we want to hear. So you better be doing what you need to be doing. Amen. serving us this morning. I want to close with just a, a moment of prayer in response to Carlos's charge to us. Let's, let's pray together as a church. Lord, we pray that you would give us grace to be faithful to your word and to this exhortation from your word this morning. Lord, cause us, Lord, to faithfully exercise compassion towards the crowds in this community and in this world. Lord, cause us to have your mercy. Lord, forgive us wherever there is self-protection that is not of you. Lord, forgive us for craving comfortable lives, Lord, craving safe experiences, Lord, and help us to long for faith, to long for conversions, and we pray that we would see them here. We pray, Lord, that in the coming days and weeks, we would see those brought from darkness to light. Lord, we pray that those that are unlike us in various ways around us, those with great needs, those with sinful lives, Lord, that we would have compassion to reach out to them. Lord, we also want to pray for Carlos and the brothers in Mexico and beyond. We pray for you to strengthen them. Lord, it is our privilege 
Lord, to know the names and the faces of those that we are closely partnered with, Lord. We're grateful, Lord, to be brothers and sisters in Christ with them. We pray you would anoint them, strengthen them. Lord, bless their efforts. Lord, bless these churches that are desiring new partnership. Help us to support and care for them faithfully. We pray for the context of training pastors, that you would let those conferences and training contexts be anointed by your spirit. We pray you would give us faith to sacrifice to support the mission around the world. Lord, help us to have faith to sacrifice financially, to sacrifice our time, Lord, to sacrifice our focus, to look away from ourselves and to invest in the expansion of your kingdom. Lord, you are able to do this. You have saved us so that we can do this. Bring this about in our church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.